I, for one, uh, am a bit optimistic. Not a bit, but quite optimistic because uh, to me, uh, I do research about classic Marvel era. Uh, I read about uh, uh, the writers and the artists and the editors who have been part of uh, Marvel since the 40s all the way to 2011. The success that they had achieved during this era uh, with respect to their characters, with respect to the crossover events, with respect to uh, retcons, with respect to any new concept that they brought in to uh, superheroism. Uh, it just took their titles through the roof. And uh, the difference for me with this relaunch is that this this relaunch is addresses one key aspect uh, within any publishing house. Uh, I, we a lot of us are not aware how a publishing house works or who on whom does it depend on. Uh, yes, uh, the print industry overall in the world is going through a decline. Uh, because people are leave, reading their stuff online, but that's not the case with the comic book industry. Why? Because comic books are, uh, uh, are for, for a lot of collectors, they are an investment, they are a means to an early retirement. If there is some kind of a groundbreaking issue or a groundbreaking crossover or, uh, or a gimmick cover that comes about, which might be having a value worth thousands of dollars uh, 10 years down the line, uh, so the print edition uh, or the hard copies for comic books still matter unlike uh, what's the situation with the newspapers and magazines and all these uh, different titles. Now in this respect the editor-in-chief is the person who is responsible for uh, providing direction when it comes to the content strategy. Uh, Stan Lee gave a direction, Roy Thomas gave a direction. Uh, even a guy like Gary Conway, uh, he was an editor-in-chief very briefly for Marvel Comics. He gave a direction that, no, it's not going to be, uh, it always is going to be about superhero saves uh, a life, the love of his life. Like uh, the, the, the convention that was established was that every time Lois Lane would uh, be in trouble Superman is gonna be able to save her Gary Conway said no superheroes will fail in saving their loved ones in saving trying to save the people they want to save and trying to do the good they, they, they will fail so Gary Conway gave a direction and then came Jim Shooter uh, but there was one underlying uh, synergy in all of their direction and that synergy was that the, the issue of being a hero does your superpower make you a hero or is there something within you your character that makes you a hero so Marvel has always focused on this direction and based on that the characters that they created the, the, the stories that they have created the universe that has been created uh, as a result of this is the reason behind its success, enormous success. Uh, Marvel superheroes are not loved by their communities, uh, unlike DC superheroes. Marvel superheroes uh, live in, mostly, mostly live in uh, real world cities like New York City and Los Angeles. Unlike DC where you have Metropolis, where you have Gotham, where you have Star um, uh, Coast City and you have Central City. So, uh, Marvel relates uh, to its readership, to their issues, to their personal struggles and so forth. Now, uh, Axel Alonso, ever since he took up uh, the mantle of editor-in-chief for Marvel, one of the things that was lost, in my opinion, was that the direction. I mean, in what direction do we need to take these characters uh, in the second decade of the 21st century? Uh, and one of the most unfortunate things that you, you can see from this era is that Axel Alonso had one of the most imaginative minds 
uh, in comic book industry, Brian Michael Bendis, and still the company was struggling big time in selling comic books and so forth. Uh, maybe Axel Alonso believed in the chatter, uh, the political chatter way too much, and uh, that uh, uh, built his focus ar uh, around diversity rather than the content itself. Uh, if I create a Muslim superhero, if I create an LGBT superhero, uh, or if I somehow come up and say, oh, this particular superhero was a, was a gay character all along, and still my sales are not going up, uh, it means that uh, this is a bold political statement that's good for uh, scoring points politically. Um, uh, but it's not something that can make your business viable. I am a Muslim and frankly I wasn't very, uh, too much excited uh, when I heard about Kamala Khan. It's not that I have any issues uh, uh, concerning the character or the way G. Willow Wilson wrote the stories. Or G I respect her a lot. She's one of the best comic book writers ever. Um, uh, and But the thing is, I mean like I, I just feel like that superheroes need to be away from these things. This is my personal opinion. A lot of people can uh, don't want to uh, agree with it. Perfectly fine. But this is my opinion that superheroes need to be free from the shackles of a religious identity or a sexual orientation identity and so forth. But then again, there is another aspect to it that how people are going to find things relatable. Uh, I never had that issue uh, uh, because there are some things which are uh, even though if you take the religion and the orientation and all these things uh, uh, aside there are a lot of things through which uh, readers can relate to uh, their heroes I mean Chris Claremont uh, was able to deliver one phenomenal story after another uh, he his story writing was the key force that made x-men the most successful franchise in the entire comic book industry at the time and despite the fact that jim shooter had a policy a strict policy of no sexual orientation discussion within the comics uh, storylines uh, he addressed the issue of uh, discrimination he, he addressed and discrimination is not just with a particular uh, 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 particular group of people with a uh, particular sexual orientation no discrimination is with people who follow a different way of life discrimination is uh, happens to people who have a different skin color so everyone was able to relate to the x-men franchise everyone and that was the thing. I mean, if a massive audience is able to relate to your uh, franchise, is able to relate to your superheroes, is able finds your your content relatable, then imagine when they come and buy your books, the sales will go through the roof. That's logical. But when you try to make your superheroes uh, restricted for a minority within a minority or a minority within a societal segment then frankly speaking don't expect your sales uh, numbers to go up uh, what do the readers need irrespective of who they are irrespective of where they come from we are Marvel loyalists the Marvel loyalists want their heroes back we want the best stories. We want stories like The Night Gwen Stacy Died. We want stories like uh, recent Dan Slott's uh, New Ways to Die. We want um, uh, Dark Phoenix Saga type stories. We need X-Men The End. I mean, some of the work has been done in the uh, postmodern era, which is so good critically, and people are not even talking about it. People don't even know about it. and. I mean like build up on that guys and in this respect uh, maybe I have more faith in uh, Joe Kosada I have more faith in CB Sibelski because these guys they showed their creative strengths during uh, the 90s 
C. B. Sibalski was involved with a different uh, kind of uh, titles at the time. But Joe Cossard, I mean, let's not forget Marvel Knights. If you like the Black Panther movie and you're going crazy over it, then you need to thank Joe Cossarda because you know he was the guy who came up with the idea for a Marvel Knights label and he went out of his way to hire Christopher Priest, the first African American editor in comic book industry. The, yeah, mar, make that a note of it. The first African American editor in the comic book industry. He had, he initially struggled with Marvel, he struggled with DC and so forth, but this time around, he delivered the Black Panther story, starting with an 18 issue run, which continued with Mark Texera's beautiful artwork, and it proved to be one heck of a success. And this was happening when Marvel went bankrupt in the mid 90s. So the essence of Marvel is that you know these superheroes their powers are not a blessing their they, they, their lives uh, are full of struggles and struggles that we can relate to this is what marvel is it's not about uh, oh this guy is uh, gay she is a, le a, le a latina lesbian she is a muslim she it's not about that and uh, i to this day this is my love. Uh, I'm wearing this Spider-Man t-shirt. Okay, the artwork is by Keith Pollard. This is the issue from the 70s. This is how much I love that work. And still, the, the, this uh, rack that you see behind me, this is just showing you a fraction of my comic book collection. I've been through the toughest times in my life and I ended up selling some of my personal belongings just to survive, but I didn't sell these books. You know which books I sold? all my marvel books from 2002 to present day i simply sold them because they were so unbearable and uh, we can all remember one thing and you can tell that uh, a publishing house is running out of ideas uh, secret wars and then comes secret wars 2 then you have civil war and then comes civil war 2 and then you're 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 trying to make old man logan part of the mainstream universe and then i mean what the heck is going on brian michael bendis is uh, uh one heck of a writer but i think him moving to dc comics is the best thing that has happened not only for dc but for him and marvel uh, we need a good direction uh, strategic direction long-term direction that brings us our heroes back. CB Sibalski, Joe Cosada, my personal request to you guys, don't make me take back my words. Don't disappoint me and many like me. We are really looking forward to a marvel that we loved throughout our lives. And nothing would make me and people like me more happy that my children and my children's children would love the Marvel comics the same way their ancestors did. Keep up the good work, make mine marvel.